Hello, everyone, and welcome to China Perspectives, a podcast on economic and credit developments in China, with experts from both within and outside of Fitch. My name is Jeremy Zook, your host for today's episode and Fitch's lead sovereign analyst for China. A few months ago, we had a podcast on the shifting patterns of China's outward direct investment, supply chains, and broader trade flows stemming both from China's general development trends and rising geopolitical tensions. One of the key themes from that conversation was the growing importance of ASEAN as a trade bloc for China. Given its geographic proximity, ASEAN has always been an important trade partner of China, but trade flows have steadily accelerated over the last decade, particularly so in the past several years. Spurring these changes are a slew of factors from shifting global supply chains, growing consumer demand, and deeper trade ties through agreements such as the recent Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Since 2020, ASEAN surpassed the EU to become China's largest trade partner, and in 2023, it surpassed the US as China's largest export destination. Today, we thought it would be valuable to take a deep dive looking at trade ties between China and ASEAN, focusing on the state of current trade flows, key policy issues, and the outlook for the China-ASEAN trade relationship. To walk us through these topics, we are privileged to have with us Dr. Deborah Elms, the head of trade policy at the Heinrich Foundation in Singapore. Dr. Elms has spent her career focused on trade policy issues, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. Prior to joining the Heinrich Foundation, she was the executive director and founder of the Asian Trade Center. She was also president of the Asia Business Trade Association and board director of the Asian Trade Center Foundation. Before this, she was the head of Temasek Foundation for Trade Negotiations and senior fellow of international political economy at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Dr. Elms also serves on the board of the Trade and Investment Negotiation Advisor at the UN Economic and Social Commission for the Asia-Pacific. Deborah, it's great to have you with us here today. Thank you. Before we get started, I thought it would be useful for our listeners if you would be able to share a bit of background on the Heinrich Foundation. It would also be great to hear some of a bit more about your role there and some of the key areas that you're focused on at the moment. Fantastic. Thanks so much. It's an honor to be here. I am at the Heinrich Foundation now as their head of trade policy. And the idea behind that is to beef up the outreach uh, on our research and education side, but particularly our research side, for policymakers in this region and beyond, and give them more concentrated types of research that are relevant for policymakers globally, especially at a time of dramatically changing trade relationships. So that includes things, everything from trade agreements, many of which you noted coming into this, those centered on ASEAN, those within the region, those that are across the region, global initiatives and bilateral initiatives. So lots of discussion about trade agreements of different kinds, but also some of the changes that are taking place in the trade regime, including changing supply chains. Um, and digital, the rise of digital economy, which is something that I've been working on for a long time and just continue to focus on different ways in which the digital revolution is making a difference in trade flows. And then I think coming up quickly on our agenda will be more work on climate and trade. We've had a lot of work, of course, on climate, um, and we've had work on trade, but what has been missing is that interplay between the way that climate change is playing out in the trade landscape. And I think the imposition out of Europe of their carbon border adjustment mechanism or CBAM is really driving people to recognize that we need to have a better conversation between climate change and trade on what are the trade related implications of climate friendly policies. So those are some of the areas that I cover and that we cover here at the foundation. And of course, they have a broader remit in general, so they don't just do trade policy, but anything trade related. Well, that certainly sounds like a a very interesting role and one that I imagine uh, will will keep you busy for quite some time. I imagine no shortage of issues to research in trade policy, of course, especially in in this region. So, yeah, as as I mentioned in the introduction, ASEAN as a group has really emerged as China's largest trade partner in recent years. Uh, Could we start with just a a brief overview of some of the key trade trends that we've been seeing uh, over the past couple of years between ASEAN and China? 
And what, in your view, is kind of underpinning these growing trade linkages? Well, I think that's a complicated question. And it's complicated because there are a number of reasons why we've had changing trade profiles, particularly between China and ASEAN. The most visible are, are two, at least. So the first was the U.S.-China trade war started under the Donald Trump administration in the U.S. that led to back and forth reciprocal tariffs, 25% or more imposed almost overnight, led to real difficulties by companies in moving manufactured goods in particular back and forth between China and the United States. In And so the, the trade patterns that we had had were no longer as competitive as they had been. And that forced companies to look for alternatives. Uh, and many of those alternative places for manufacturing assembly in particular could be found in ASEAN. And so you had a shift starting under the Trump administration um, between China, ASEAN, and the United States, the sort of a three-way shuffle, if you will. Then COVID, of course, created new supply chain tensions. That was true for everyone, but it was also, of course, very true for China and especially for ASEAN. So that, I think, led to additional adjustments in uh, supply chains along the way. And then I suppose the third thing that is driving this now is just the changing global landscape more broadly, which has to do with the slowdown in the economy in both the U.S., a little bit in the U.S. and certainly in China, but also increasing and continuing trade tensions between the China and the United States and uh, a quest by firms everywhere, not just Chinese firms or ASEAN firms, to diversify their risks. And so think about alternative structures to try to limit the amount of risk that any one company is exposed to. Thanks. So I guess in terms of, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you certainly mentioned supply chains as a key driving factor. And, you know, I, I think that's one thing that that we note as well. Before we dig into some of the supply chain issues, uh, of course, RCEP uh, recently came into into force, well, back in January 2022. It's, of course, gotten a lot of coverage in terms of uh, sort of the continued evolution of trade agreements in, in the region. Uh, how has RCEP really changed the trade relationship between ASEAN and, and China so far? And I mean, what's your outlook for how this sort of shifts uh, trade dynamics going forward? So RCEP is an agreement that brought together all 10 members of ASEAN with China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. So 15 countries in RCEP. Between China and ASEAN, though, the early deliverables from RCEP are pretty modest because there was already an agreement between ASEAN and China that is actually a pretty decent agreement that had a lot of use by companies. So if you look at China-ASEAN trade, much of that trade in manufactured goods and some on agricultural products takes place using the existing ASEAN-China agreement. It takes a while for RCEP to catch up to the benefits that are found in ASEAN-China because the, the RCEP agreement is a bigger agreement. It takes longer to phase in some of those benefits. And so specifically between China and ASEAN, the benefits are going to be slow to materialize. I'm not seeing a lot of changes in the China ASEAN lanes as a result of RCEP. Where we do see changes though, because of RCEP, is in Northeast Asia. So China, Japan, and Korea were not united before by any trade agreements. And now RCEP starts to open up those markets to one another and there is a lot more traction in Northeast Asia as a result of RCEP. And that, and that has already begun and I think will accelerate as the tariff reductions between those three parties continues to phase in over time. So I think RCEP is important to watch. It can deliver useful benefits, uh, especially because it allows you to trade with 15 markets all at once using one set of production methods. That's very helpful for companies. But it doesn't provide immediate benefits as much as you might expect, certainly in the ASEAN China trade lanes, but it does provide benefits in Northeast Asia. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the longstanding free trade agreement between ASEAN and China does uh, sort of mute some of those benefits, at least in the near term. I guess uh, for sort of the outlook when it comes to continued trade negotiations, I mean, what do you see sort of as the next steps in this trade partnership? I, I understand negotiations are sort of ongoing 
over the ASEAN China Free Trade Agreement 3.0. You know, China has also expressed interest in joining the CPTPP along with several other ASEAN countries, in addition to the ones that are already members of this pact. So how do you see these prospects for trade agreements and what will this mean for trade ties? Does it have sort of a, a similar impact, perhaps muted at first, as, as RCEP? Well, I think an important message that I try to give to policymakers and businesses is that while trade agreements and negotiating trade agreements is not seen as a good outcome in the United States and is increasingly under pressure in the European Union and in Europe in general, in Asia, there is still a strong impulse for economic integration. And there is still a heightened desire to keep markets open, to provide market liberalization opportunities. And you see that across the board. So you mentioned the upgrade of the ASEAN China. This is the third time that they have upgraded it. Each time that you upgrade, what you're doing is you are increasing the benefits from using the deal. So you broaden and deepen the commitments that you've made, which means, for example, you accelerate any tariff reductions that you already had planned. You, you pull them forward in time or you make them steeper. You add more services and investment uh, commitments so that you can do a lot more of the important aspects of supply chains, for example, everything from logistics and retail, distribution, warehousing, legal services, consulting company services, et cetera. All of those services can also be expanded as part of either the China ASEAN agreement or as part of RCEP. So it's not just about trade and goods. It's also about all of the other things that matter, including investment protections. Um, and I think that is a key part of the agenda in this region in terms of broadening and deepening those trade ties. What's new now, um, having done a lot of these traditional comprehensive agreements in the region, is some of them are expanding or trying to expand. And you noted the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, which does have six countries in line to join at the moment. That's politically hard. Right, It's very hard to get, especially because we have China and Taiwan both in the accession queue. That's politically difficult. And the members, the current members, the current 12, are really struggling with how to manage that process. And it may take much longer than anyone originally perhaps intended uh, to make this go forward. So we have expansion there. We have expansion in other areas. China is also looking to join the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, or DEPA. We'll have expansion of those kinds of deals. And then we have new agreements. So we have a number of new digital economy agreements, mostly bilateral, a lot of them anchored out of Singapore. So Singapore, Australia, Singapore, South Korea, Singapore, UK. I think those are important and those could continue. And then finally, I would say a new type of agreement that we're seeing as well is the beginning of climate and trade. Singapore and Australia have one. New Zealand's been leading an effort to get a diverse group of countries to sign off on a new type of climate agreement, that's much slower uh, to materialize than, again, might have been expected, but it's an unusual group of countries and they're trying to do things for the first time. So that always takes longer than you have, well, certainly than many negotiators hope when they get started. Yeah, certainly a lot to look for in, in that space uh, in, in over the next several years and beyond. Turning now back to sort of where we started the discussion, how does China view its trade relationship with ASEAN in your view? I mean, is ASEAN, you know, a destination for Chinese final products, given sort of the large and growing domestic market in, in ASEAN itself? Or as you hinted to at the beginning, I mean, is this more of a destination for intermediate goods um, simply as Chinese firms are looking to diversify their own supply chains? Uh, you know, we have seen outward FDI increasing from China into ASEAN itself. So what's sort of the, the key channel for the trade relationship going forward? I think it's both. I think that ASEAN as a region is a growing and important destination, particularly for consumer goods, because there is a large number of middle class consumers who are eager to buy product, especially products that are priced appropriately, which is how many ASEAN consumers view Chinese produced 
goods as being affordable in a time where many things are less affordable. So I think that ASEAN is a consumer market for sure, but it is also a destination market for assembly, intermediate goods, sometimes raw materials processing, and then assembly here and then export to what have always been engines of growth, US, Europe, Japan, Australia, you know, some of the advanced economies where the demand is high. So I think it's a bit of a mix. It's both diversify into this region because the region itself has potential economic benefits, but also diversify into the region because you can use it as a platform for exports elsewhere. And I think you see both. And you saw them, just to be clear, it's not that the that the U.S. trade war started this process. You saw this movement from China into the region before that happened, particularly driven by cost concerns in China, where many of the production costs were becoming quite high, labor costs, et cetera. And a search for better value led many Chinese companies to this region. And I think that early pathway has just been accelerated because of the trade war, COVID, and ongoing geopolitical tensions. Yeah, certainly. I think we would also agree that it's quite difficult to disentangle some of those key drivers. Uh, I mean, as you say, these trends were ongoing before the trade war itself, but certainly have been accelerated. I guess, you know, when we look at the relationship between China and ASEAN when it comes to trade, we, we've seen, especially in recent years, uh, quite a bit of a growing Chinese trade surplus vis-a-vis ASEAN more broadly. There, there are, of course, quite significant variations across the region. Uh, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia do run trade surpluses vis-a-vis China. But, you know, something globally, of course, as you know, this has often been a, a cause of concern when it comes to trade relationships with China. How do you see this from sort of the ASEAN perspective? I mean, is this a growing sort of disparity in, in when it comes to trade becoming a bit of a challenge for policymakers in, in ASEAN? I think there's two potential challenges ahead for ASEAN policymakers. One is a potential backlash by domestic producers and domestic retailers against imported products, especially from China, which are reaching very high volumes um, and are threatening the livelihoods, many policymakers would argue, of local companies who are trying to compete. So if you are making well, almost any consumer product, it can be hard to compete against inbound Chinese competitiveness because the price, the speed, the scale is just not ASEAN speed. <laughs> so, so one is you could be facing backlash from your domestic, especially producers, favored producers, and domestic retailers. And then second, and, and I think this is a looming potential issue, You could also face backlash from outside the region. And in particular, I would say, if we have a second Donald Trump administration out of the White House, then some of the countries in this region, particularly Vietnam, are also at risk because much of that production coming out of China is now going into Vietnam and then from Vietnam into the United States, which is driving surpluses out of Vietnam to the U.S. to record levels. And the Trump himself and at least his past administration, presumably his future one as well, are hyper-focused on trade balances in manufactured goods. So when they see a huge spike out of Vietnam, it triggers a lot of focus on what are we going to do about the Vietnam-U.S. trade lane, which could have, again, implications for China if a lot of those products are coming in from China and they're having some level of assembly in Vietnam before being sent to the U.S. So I think there's sort of two challenges. One is the domestic level challenges that come from hyper-competitive markets out of China. And two is what that does to you in the broader landscape. Not every ASEAN member has the same second challenge, but some of them are really going to be in the crosshairs, I think. Yeah, no, I think this is a year of sort of election uncertainty across the region. And as you mentioned, of course, in the U.S., that's going to be looming large for the rest of the year and will have quite important implications for for trade, as you say, not just with China, but with uh, ASEAN more broadly. Um, Turning a bit to that, you know, ASEAN does seem to be caught a bit in the middle between U.S. and, and China when it comes to the trade tensions between those two countries. 
How are these trade tensions, and you already touched on this a, a bit in your previous remarks, how, how are they affecting ASEAN countries and how are the policymakers in the region sort of positioning themselves to navigate some of these uh, growing geopolitical strains? And then I guess more broadly, it's always hard to define a, a winner and a loser in, in this type of situation, but uh, sort of how do you see ASEAN countries emerging from these geopolitical tensions uh, in terms of de-risking and global supply chains? So I would say that most ASEAN policymakers have viewed this disruption, chaos, turmoil, adjustment, fill in the blank, what term you want to use, as an opportunity. And so most ASEAN policymakers have seen from the, especially the beginning, again, of the Trump administration through to today, that they have a unique position that they can offer, which is we're not China, we're not the United States, we're in between, we deal with both. We have an opportunity to be a neutral broker and to be able to supply, especially goods, to anywhere. And you know, China, U.S., Europe. We haven't talked much about Europe, but it matters as well here in this region. So ASEAN policymakers have viewed this as an opportunity. I think that's a challenge, actually. Uh, yes, there are definitely opportunities for the region to continue to play this role between all of these big players. But this is a very trade-dependent part of the economy. And if we end up with tensions that lock down big parts of the economy for domestic protectionism reasons in the U.S., in China, in Europe, um, then it's even harder for trade-dependent region to be successful. And so I think there is, in my view, a little too much um, relaxed attitude in ASEAN about the future and about their role in that future. I don't think it's quite as bright as they often would like you to believe, or as I think they actually do believe. Because again, the risks are growing for ASEAN policymakers, that there will be significant changes ahead. And their ability to influence those changes are minimal because they're not they're not a big player. I mean they would they are as a group. So when they when ASEAN talks, which they do a very nice job of trying to play up their 10 markets, 600 million growing middle class, you know, sixth or so growing global economy. That's all sounds great. But actually, especially in geopolitics, they don't act as a group very often. And so I think that creates a challenge, right? So on the one hand, you benefit from chaos elsewhere. But on the other hand, you are not influencing that chaos. So you have to take whatever you get. And that, I think, is going to become increasingly challenging for the region. Interesting. So it's, it's more complicated than, you know, supply chains simply shifting to, to the region and, and the region taking the benefit of those shifts in supply chains. I mean, I think so. I think one thing that does help ASEAN a bit is what are the supply chains that they're particularly good at? And they tend to be, not entirely, but they tend to be some of the less strategically urgent ones. So while we have some of the firms in ASEAN, for example, that are engaged in semiconductor production, testing, assembly, et cetera, and we have some that are engaged in critical mineral, either extraction or usage, both of those are relatively minor compared to the rest of ASEAN's footprint. In other words, ASEAN's very good at a lot of things, but many of them are, you know, manufacturing furniture or carpeting or whatever. It's it's not the most sensitive of areas. And I think that may shield them from some of the worst implications of growing trade tensions, because it's unlikely, at least in my view, it's unlikely in the near term that we're going to have some kind of crazy draconian rule that says you can no longer send cabinets and tables back and forth. It will, it will be focused on strategically important goods. And that you know that's not what a lot of ASEAN is involved in. Yeah, very interesting. I guess from yeah, just one final question, you know, of course, China trying to manage these uh, geopolitical tensions and, uh, you know, their relationship with ASEAN at the same time, you know, what's being done to sort of mitigate, uh, I suppose, from the Chinese side, some of these potential risks that could emerge from, you know, U.S.-China trade tensions for their own relationship with ASEAN? Well, that's a good question. I think this is an area where we talk a lot about the United States sort of fumbling its approach, especially its economic approach to the region. 
and having a very weak approach through their Indo-Pacific economic framework. But I, I'm not sure that the Chinese have actually done a much better job, to be honest. I mean, they're assuming that past trade relationships, I think, will continue to hold. But I don't see a strong effort to continue to support and engage with the region. There is definitely an effort to engage with certain markets, especially by Chinese companies or Chinese state-owned companies to work with certain markets. But I think there is a bit of a gap, actually, between initiatives that you could imagine the Chinese government taking towards the region and what they're actually doing on the ground. So I think the assumption is that they, they have to fight fires elsewhere, which, I mean, makes a certain amount of sense. But you don't want to, I would argue, you don't really want to take ASEAN for granted either. Yeah, no, certainly. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, of course, now that China's biggest trading partner and provides very important linkages, again, through those supply chains to the rest of the world as well. Well, thank you again for your time and insights today, Deborah. This has been a, an incredibly interesting and, and important discussion and certainly an, an area that we all have to keep an eye on going forward, especially in this year of pretty significant elections. I would encourage all of our listeners to keep an eye out for Deborah's latest research and commentaries on Asian as well as global trade policy issues, which can be found on the Heinrich Foundation website. You've been listening to Fitch Ratings China Perspectives podcast. To learn more about our ratings and research on China, please visit FitchRatings.com. And to keep an eye out for upcoming episodes of China Perspectives, subscribe to China Perspectives on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast.